back from Ontario now. Now I'm sure as a fair number of you are aware, Schwinn had sent me their adventure bike in around August of this year. So I've been living with it and riding it for about three or four months. And I'm thinking that's long enough now that it's deserving of its own review video. So Schwinn's a company with a fairly rich history in the world of cycling, whether it's just like iconic bikes or just success in the world of racing. It's obvious to tell that they're trying to kind of get back to that with these Schwinn Signature Series bikes. The Vantage RX-1 is obviously the model to target the adventure market. So what is it? It's an aluminum frame with a carbon fork, and the frame uses the smooth ride technology elastomer, which allows for a little more flex in this area to further isolate a rider from any sort of like road vibration. You know, that ever important vertically compliant, laterally stiff bike stuff. The fork is carbon with an alloy straight 1 1 8 steer. It does use a 15 millimeter through axle on the front, but it's just your typical quick release for the rear. Throughout the entire bike, it's external cable routing, which I like a lot better because it just makes your life easier. And further to that, uh, nice, easy, threaded bottom bracket. So, easy maintenance there. To match the added compliance that's built into the frame with the smooth ride technology, the bike is specced with one of these Transax anti-shock stems, and clamped into the stem is some unbranded, marginally flared drop bars. I'm a really big fan of these bars. Mounted on there for hoods, you've got SRAM Rival 22 hydro brakes, and uh, well, 11 speed shifters. Which of course is gonna control a SRAM Rival 11 speed rear derailleur, which shifts over an 11 through to 32 cassette. And up front you got a SRAM Rival Yaw front derailleur over an FSA Gossamer crank using a 50 tooth and a 34 tooth chain ring. For calipers we have SRAM Rival post mounts. The rear uses a 160 millimeter rotor and so does the front. The wheels are formula hubs laced to asymmetrical Alex rims. I didn't know this till I looked it up, but apparently they're tubeless ready. And wrapped around them are relatively smooth Continental 35 millimeter tires. I personally think that's a really impressive amount of kit for this kind of money. As someone who spent the last three years wrenching and working in a bike shop, I always tend to err on the side of pessimism when it comes to buzzwordy sounding frame technology. And I'm definitely guilty of just passing off anything sort of new as like a marketing scheme, something to try and sell more bikes. But after these last about four months, being able to actually go from this bike to maybe some of my more harsh riding bikes, it's definitely interesting to note that the elastomer built into the seat tube of this bike and the stem itself actually do make a difference. Now that's not to say that it acts kind of like a mountain bike suspension, that's not the case at all. What the elastomers actually do a good job at is kind of hiding all the inconsistencies in a road. Like things are getting a little bit bumpy here and I can feel it, but there's no harshness. You just kind of feel like you're floating along the top of most of it. But make no mistake, if you do hit a bit of a rock that's sticking out of a trail like this, you're gonna feel it. Like, it's not going to take the edge off of that. This with the stock tires on it even is, is pretty good, but I can imagine how much better it would be if you filled to 44 millimeters of tire, say in like a tubeless setup, how buttery smooth it could be. Then all those like sharp edges well, those would just sort of disappear completely. Although I have been quite fond of these tires, they are quite good. Uh, I probably, I'd probably buy them for other bikes. I've sort of compared the geometries between most of the bikes I have, and it's actually not far off based on what they have published. In fact, it's got a more aggressive, steeper head tube angle than my cross bike does, yet something that's not published in their geometry makes this thing feel sort of sluggish. Maybe it's the longer wheelbase. Maybe there's something going on trail-wise because the fork does have a little bit more rake, but I don't know what it is. Standing up and hammering up a climb with this does not feel fast and it does not feel sprightly. There's nothing about the way this bike works together 
that makes it feel like it wants to kind of dance up anything. But seemingly the trade-off for this is just this wildly stable ride. Going down a rocky descent with this bike does inspire quite a bit of confidence. You're not on the brakes the entire time. The head tube on this thing is a mile long. It puts you in a really upright, super comfortable position. The stem that comes spec on it is 100 mil. I don't know what it is, but maybe it's just that I'm not used to such a tall head tube. I'm used to reaching down a little bit longer, but I can see why people enjoy it. A setup like this means you can just jump on a trail like this and ride all day and still feel, you know, as fresh as you can after riding all day. The Rival 22 drivetrain is fantastic. Of course, I'm a little bit biased on that, that's fair. Using a compact crank set with a 11 speed 11 through 32 kind of gives you an overly generous array of gear choices. And one thing worth noting front derailleur wise, these SRAM yaw front derailleurs work so good that they almost feel broken. Hey, you guys. Objectively, Schwinn set out to build an adventure bike that was well-specced, comfortable, desirable, and affordable. And I can attest the fact that they achieved that goal. The technology used in this bike to achieve the comfort that it has is something generally found on more expensive bikes from other companies. Rival 22 is also usually found on bikes around the $2,000 mark, not the $1,600 mark. Further on top of that group set, you've got hydraulic brakes instead of cable pull. The threaded bottom bracket with the BB386 is a nice touch. The through axle on the front is good. I just kind of wish it had it on the rear as well. That would have really knocked it out of the park. But at this price point for everything else you're getting, it's really hardly a place that you can actually complain. The non-tapered head tube is sort of interesting, but I think it kind of adds to the comfort of the bike. So maybe that was where that decision came from. That's what Richie does. So it's gotta be worth something. Yeah, objectively, the Vantage RX1 is really, really good, especially for the price. As designed and who they designed it for, it is perfect. Especially for someone who's looking for a really comfortable ride who doesn't want to bend over too far. Throwing on the 44s that can fit in here. But subjectively, the length of this head tube is just about 40 millimeters too tall. At least. With the head tube being that tall, I just can't get into the desired fit that I would prefer have. In a word, the steering feels maybe a little slower than I'm used to. But as a review, it's almost not even really fair for me to bring that up. They were building a comfortable adventure bike, not a really aggressive gravel bike or a cyclocross bike. So for me to sit here and try and fault it for not being an aggressive cyclocross race bike just isn't fair. The RX-1 handles on the road and off the road exactly the way it was designed to. Sturdy, stable, and comfortable. 